Very good evening to those who are joining us for our first of our three weekly services of prayers across Europe uh, for Ukraine. Uh, this is the first of three that we should do in the run-up to Christmas. Um, thank you so much for joining this evening. I'm sure many of you will know the, uh, as it were, rules of the road for these events by now. We do ask that you stay on mute unless you or already arranged as a participant in the service. Uh, Alice and Alison are going to respond on behalf of all of us. Um, and uh, please do join in uh, with the responses, but uh, please do so with your Zoom on mute. Uh, at the end of the service, there'll be some music and we'll leave uh, quietly and log out at any at any point in, in that process. Um, but there will be some music. Smither will uh, introduce the service just after about five five thirty. When we come to the hymns again, uh, there's a hymn towards the end. Please do feel free to join in with that. But again, remain on mute for it, otherwise it will be um, well. You will all make a beautiful and joyful noise, but the other Zoom doesn't uh, automatically build a choir. Um, that functionality has yet to be developed for us. Thank you. 
Good evening. The Lord is my light and my salvation. My God shall make my darkness to be bright. The light and peace of Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Come, Lord Jesus. Do not delay. Give new courage to your people who trust in your love. By your coming, raise us to share in the joy of your kingdom on earth as in heaven, where you live and reign with the Father and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise now and forever. Amen. In this season of Advent, we journey from darkness into light as we prepare for the celebration of the coming of the Messiah at Christmas. Nowhere in our world is the darkness more obviously experienced than in Ukraine. On Christmas Eve, it will be 10 months to the day since the Russian invasion began. Now, for many hours each day, whole cities are thrown into literal darkness as a result of the frequent power cuts caused by the Russian attacks. In Lent, we gathered each Wednesday to pray for Ukraine. Now, we do, do so again each week through this season of Advent. Later in the service, we will hear from Bishop Robert Innes, who has just returned from Ukraine. He visited Kyiv and the surrounding area with Archbishop Justin Welby last week. Whilst he was there, Bishop Robert met members of Christchurch Kyiv, including Kristina Lukashenko, the church warden, who was also the interpreter for, at all the meetings. Kristina recorded this message for us this evening, which speaks not just of the darkness, but also of the light. As Christians, we all believe that 
God creates miracles and this year in Ukraine we found out that it was quite true in literary terms because when the war started Ukraine was supposed to surrender within three days but the miracle happened and Ukraine somehow survived then another miracle happened those people who flew out from Ukraine at that time they found hospitality they were accepted they were not expelled from neighboring countries and they found a lot of support friendship hospitality although there were no hope for them to find all that this was another miracle the third miracle happened when ukrainian army managed to defeat the russians in the north although everything predicted that they would be destroyed and the russian army miraculously withdrawn from the north of ukraine and somehow the capital of ukraine was not conquered this was the third miracle then the new miracle happened and the russians were repealed from northern ukraine from around Kharkiv and another miracle happened we received a lot of support material support in weapons in provisions in a lot of humanitarian aid from our supporters in the east from our western in the west from our western friends and we felt ourselves stronger this was another miracle and miracles continue to happen that when we survive through very intensive attacks and shellings and our infrastructure is very much damaged we miraculously manage to restore it and to survive through these periods of blackouts again with a lot of help with a lot of support with supplies in spare parts and equipment in generators coming from abroad and we are continuously grateful to god for all that miracles and we understand that we have to be to be um, to deserve all these miracles we have to be faithful we have to be prayerful and we have to remember about our christian values to show that we are christians and with that we deserve god's help in jesus name as christian
that this evening may be holy, good and peaceful. Let us pray with one heart and mind. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. A reading from First Peter. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The gospel is taken from Matthew chapter 24 beginning at verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Then they will hand you over to be tortured and will put you to death, and you will be hated by nations because of my name. Then many will fall away, and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But anyone who endures to the end will be saved. And this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Jesus said, but anyone who endures to the end will be saved. I've just returned from a visit to Ukraine where I was part of a group accompanying the Archbishop of Canterbury. The purpose of our visit was to listen and to learn and to offer whatever pastoral support we could to Christians in a situation of real suffering. The visit was profoundly moving. 
we received gracious hospitality and the warmest of welcomes. We heard and saw things that were shocking and horrifying, but we also heard stories of remarkable resilience and endurance. On the third day of our trip, we visited Irpin, which lies just 25 kilometers north of the center of Kiev. A river on the edge of Irpin marks the limit of the Russian advance southwards from the Belarusian border. Ukrainian forces blew up and destroyed a key river bridge on the main road from Irpin to Kyiv. We were driven by minibus to see this river crossing by the Reverend Ivan Rusin, the head of the Ukraine Evangelical Theological Seminary. On the day of our visit, it was snowy and very cold. We saw an upturned bus lying next to the mangled steel bridge structure. Ivan took us down a precarious icy path to a temporary river crossing made of planks of wood. Ivan explained how he himself had helped Ukrainians fleeing for their lives from the advancing Russian troops to cross the river on a pontoon bridge under hostile gunfire. We asked him if he was scared. He said he was very scared, but the people needed his help. Alongside the bridge were a series of rough crosses, each one testifying to someone who'd lost his or her life in this place. And yet the bridge is now known as the Bridge of Hope, because it was the place where the invasion was halted, and it was the river crossing over which many people were successfully escorted to freedom on the other side. Many people had stories to tell about that spring 2022 invasion. The Archbishop of the Greek Catholic Church told us that his name was near the top of a Russian wanted list. He lived just three kilometers from the front line. He considered it a minor miracle that he was still alive. A metropolitan from the Ukrainian Orthodox lived on territory that had been invaded, and he described how his own house had been looted. But he said, I was lucky. My neighbor's house was destroyed. After visiting Irpin, we drove to the neighboring city of Buchar. There, a Greek Catholic priest took us into his church. The main basilica now houses an exhibition of photographs. We saw horrifying pictures of bodies that had been left lying on roadsides, some with their hands tied behind their backs. There was abundant photographic evidence of torture and the killing of civilians. Outside the church, there is a large field in which bodies had been dumped in a mass grave. We felt a deep sense of revulsion against those who had committed these crimes and those who continued to deny that they happened. And yet somehow in, in and amongst all of this, Christian faith exists and in some cases is deepening. A Baptist army chaplain told me about his experience of praying with soldiers on the front line in the Donbass. An Orthodox metropolitan suggested that in suffering, our faith is strangely deepened and our dependence upon God increased. And many people spoke of the smaller and greater miracles that led to their deliverance or the deliverance of someone they knew. In our gospel reading from St. Matthew, Jesus talks of the period leading up to the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, wars and rumours of wars, people being tortured and killed, nation rising up against nation. That is the situation that exists in Ukraine today. With the possible and smaller scale exception of Kosovo and Serbia, this is a conflict unlike anything that Europe has witnessed since the Second World War. In the situation of the first century, Jesus counsels endurance. Anyone who endures to the end will be saved. And so in our time, we would love to be able to predict the end of the Ukraine war, and we would love that end to come swiftly. Sadly, and on the basis of what I saw on my visit, I do not see the end coming soon. 
and I fear there will be a great deal more suffering still to come, firstly in Ukraine, but more widely in Europe, where we will suffer price rises and shortages of energy, and in the global south, where this war is already causing poverty and famine. I witnessed firsthand the effects of the attacks on critical infrastructure in Ukraine. It's eerie to see whole areas of a capital city in darkness. And it was the first time that I've had to seek shelter having received a bomb alert on my mobile phone. It's very cold in Ukraine in the winter. Without electricity, the water in the combined heat and power plants that heat the cities may freeze. If that happens, those plants can't be used again until the spring. Without heating in a Ukrainian winter, life is scarcely possible. I'm afraid there's the real likelihood that Ukraine faces a humanitarian catastrophe this coming winter. What can we do? Well, firstly, we can do what Christians always do, which is to pray. We can pray that God will continue to work miracles of salvation in Kyiv and across Ukraine, as he is doing. And in our prayers, we can express solidarity with our Ukrainian brothers and sisters in their suffering. As I discovered last week, our support, our solidarity, our reassurance that we have not forgotten them, really does matter. And then secondly, we have to prepare ourselves and our Western European countries for tough times ahead. An unjustifiable and illegal war has been begun against Ukraine, and we have to stand with Ukraine in this. And that will mean bearing the cost of shortages, of inflation, of high energy prices, of falling living standards. This is a cause in which European nations must stand strong and must stand together. And thirdly, we must give whatever help and assistance we can to those suffering from the effects of the war. The appeal which we launched earlier this year raised some 400,000 euros, I think. A good deal of that's already been spent either by donations to ecumenical partners or directly in our diocese. Everywhere I went in Ukraine, people wanted to tell me how grateful they were for the support received, especially, in fact, from Great Britain. We may well face a further massive exodus of women and children from Ukraine during this coming winter, in the next few weeks even. And again, we have to be ready and prepared as people and nations to receive and to welcome them as we have already done. It's hard at the moment to see a way out of this terrible crisis. Yet as one Ukrainian church leader reminded me, we as Christians hold to what is sometimes called a doctrine of providence, that in and through times of war, as well as times of peace, God is working his purposes out. The life of Jesus was worked out against a background of foreign occupation. And 40 years after Jesus' death, the city of Jerusalem was ransacked and its temple utterly destroyed. Yet Jesus rose from the dead. And during Advent, we celebrate the hope that he will come again to judge the living and the dead and to put all things to right. So we pray and wait in hope for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Meanwhile, we can see and seek the miracles that he works in the most difficult conditions. We can be thankful that faith grows even amidst intense suffering, and we can surely find inspiration for our own faith in the strength and the resilience of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. Thanks be to God. Amen.
that you would deliver us by the mystery of your incarnation, by your baptism, fasting and temptation, by your cross and passion, and by your glorious resurrection and ascension, we ask you, hear us, good Lord. That you would rule and govern aright your holy church universal, giving light to all clergy to understand your word and in their preaching and life to commend it. Most especially, we pray for the churches, clergy and congregations of Ukraine and Russia. We ask you, hear us, good Lord. <clears throat> that you would keep and strengthen King Charles and all those in authority to bring them to humility and faith, give them grace to execute justice and to pursue truth in unity, peace, and concord. Especially we pray at this time for President Zelensky, President Putin, and for those who lead NATO and the European Union. We ask you, hear us, good Lord. That you would bring help and comfort to all in danger, fear and desolation. Preserving those who must travel far from home, leaving behind those they love that you would provide for and defend the orphans, the mothers with young children, and those who are sick and handicapped. We ask you, hear us, good Lord. That you would forgive our enemies and turn their hearts that you would look with mercy on those waging a war they did not choose and do not understand. That you would prosper the cause of those who speak truth in the media and take a stand for integrity. We ask you, hear us, good Lord. That you would grant favour to all those who seek to offer welcome and shelter, warmth, and food to those escaping from conflict. We ask you, hear us, good Lord. That you would swiftly bring an end to our present darkness. Keep safe those who have no hope but you, and bring us through this time to know our need of you, the only sovereign Lord and Saviour of all who call upon you. We ask you, hear us, good Lord. Trusting in the compassion of God, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray by ourselves while listening to the prayer in Ukrainian. Отче наш, що єси на небесах, засвятиться ім'я Твоє, нехай прийде царство Твоє, нехай буде воля Твоя, як на небі, так і на землі. Хліб наш насущний дай нам сьогодні, і прости нам провини наші, як і ми прощаємо винуватцям нашим. І не веди нас у спокусу, але визволи нас від лукавого, бо Твоє є царство і воля і слава на віки вічні. Амінь. Амінь.
we will gather again at this time on the next two Wednesdays in Advent. And next week, the speaker will be the Reverend Thomas Makipa, the chaplain in Helsinki. And on December the 21st, we hope to be joined by the Archbishop of Canterbury in a service attended by friends across England. It is still possible to give to our appeal for all people who are affected by the war in Ukraine, both those in the country and refugees who are being helped by the work of our chaplaincies and their partners. The appeal is being run in conjunction with USPG and you can give here or simply click the QR code. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. May God, our Redeemer, show us compassion and love. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.